you also mentioned there's like so many cognitive biases um, that people should know. Uh, and this can be attached to e-commerce. It can be attached to any sort of business. What is a cognitive bias when we're looking at digital marketing and, and selling? Cognitive biases are ways that our brains uh, behave in a way that isn't entirely logical. You might consider them errors, uh, say calculation errors in certain cases. And there are, depending on how you count them, dozens of these. Uh, there are some counts that go over 100. I've seen uh, numbers as high as 130 cognitive biases. Some of these are uh, minor variations on the others, but a few are really important. I probably a fundamental bias that we have is that humans are loss averse. Uh, people hate feeling a sense of loss. They hate losing something. And that often outweighs a gain. So the exact same problem posed to somebody as a loss seems more important or uh, different than the same exact math applied as a gain. So if you're told that you know, you've got a serious uh, medical problem, nine out of 10 patients who take this medicine survive, that sounds pretty good. Uh, and you probably say, okay, let's do it. Uh, that same exact math, if they said one out of every patient dies, suddenly, whoa, uh, what are the alternatives to this? Uh, those odds aren't very yeah. good. Uh, and that works uh, not just in the circumstances like that, but in financial terms, uh, losing money looms bigger than gaining the same amount of money. And there's a whole ton of experiment, uh, experimentation on this. Uh, the work of Daniel Kahneman, his book, Thinking Fast and Slow, another one I highly recommend for somebody who wants to uh, do a deep dive into this, uh, talks about that a lot. But there are lots of cognitive biases uh, there are, oh, let's see, well, temporal discounting uh, is one kind of bias. If I, I say, hey, Jared, I'll give you uh, $10 today, or in two months, I'll give you $20. Like you being a smart guy might say, well, hey, I don't need the $10 right now. I'll take the 20 in two months. But many people will take that $10 right now. Uh, even though they don't necessarily need it, uh, they discount that future value. And it's something that's very common. And that's why you have all kinds of sort of front-loaded financial offers out there that offer you know, something very immediate in the short term because people are discounting what's going to happen down the road. Everything from adjustable rate mortgages to credit card deals where, hey, we'll give you a $200 credit if you sign up for our credit card. And all these things are mm. giving people a value in the moment. Uh, there is recency bias. We tend to uh, remember things that happened more recently. Uh, there's uh, peak end experience, uh, which says that we, if we have an experience of some kind, whether it's a, a, an experience as a customer, an experience in an amusement park, or whatever, uh, the two areas that are most important are the peak experience, whatever was sort of the emotional high point, whether it was good or bad for us, uh, and then how it ended. And so one practical application of that is in the medical field where colonoscopies used to be pretty uncomfortable. Uh, today, they're between anesthesia and the current equipment, uh, they actually aren't uh, uncomfortable, but they were pain. They used to be painful. And what they found was simply by prolonging the end so it was less uncomfortable. In other words, there was a comfortable period at the end of the experience uh, before they said, okay, uh, we're done. That made the entire experience feel better to the customer. They remembered it as a less painful experience. So, I mean, there are many, many ways that our brains work uh, in a somewhat incorrect fashion. Uh, often these are shortcuts that may serve us well in certain cases. You know, if we believe evolutionary psychology, a lot of our current decision-making processes date back to our days as hunter-gatherers. Uh, for a hunter-gatherer, uh, a piece of fruit in the hand is worth much more than a piece of fruit that might be there two weeks from now, or maybe it won't be there two weeks from now. And yeah. you know, so there, there are good reasons for some of these. Oh, very good reasons. Like fear is a, is it like we've talked about the, the you know, fear. Um, we don't want to possibly run off a cliff. If we didn't have fear, we would just do that um, and possibly die. So uh, I think there's... Right. And that's, you know, I think our stress reaction too is an example of that because uh, reacting to uh, sudden stimuli... Uh, and having a kick in our adrenaline is good if you had to worry about a carnivorous animal hiding in the woods. Uh, <laughs> but when we're in an office environment and our boss uh, sends us a memo and says, hey, we have to talk, uh, come to my office at four o'clock, uh, that's going to kick in uh, the, that same effect 
uh, but it's not going to serve us very well because we don't have to suddenly uh, run away at high speed. We just mm. have to show up at four o'clock. So yeah, it, there's mm. good and bad. Yeah, I, I'm very curious about the one that you mentioned on where people will take the gratifications right away rather than delayed gratification. What's that cognitive bias? The one where you explained where people will kind of buy something on afterpay in a way that they they it might be like 50 months interest free what is that cognitive bias called and well uh, it's typically called temporal discounting some temporal discounting is okay uh, if you say i'll give you ten dollars today or ten dollars and ten cents uh, in a year i'll take the ten dollars today because i can uh, not that i'm gonna invest that ten dollars but it's not a good deal to wait a year for it uh, but yeah opportunity uh, cost it's, it's, it becomes a cognitive bias a negative cognitive bias when we make decisions that don't really make um, logical sense. Now, obviously, too, if we have zero money in our wallet, $10 today may be better than $20 in a month. But mm -hmm. assuming we're like most people where it's not going to be life altering, uh, we need to be making those kinds of decisions in a somewhat calculated way. Yeah, yeah, I got you. It's fascinating because as humans, like our makeup is that if you said like you can have a banana now or you can have it in, you know, back in the day, like ancestral, like you could have two in two months time or one month time or a week's time, it might actually be best to take that banana and eat it right now because there might actually be no bananas in two weeks time. Right. Yeah. There was really not necessarily a concept of uh, high trust where you knew for sure that something would be there uh, just, just because of the nature of the circumstances, you know? So yeah, it's different. And I think we even see that uh, in our pet behavior today. Uh, if mm. I give my dog uh, two dog biscuits, uh, he's not going to save one for later. He's going to eat them both right away. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. I think their survival mechanisms are a lot stronger than ours as humans, which have evolved probably past what a, a canine might be. So I want to talk about the psychology and the behavioral marketing, because a lot of people listening are have an online business and they may want to change the copy in their on their website or on their blog posts or on their product descriptions what are some of the things that you've seen cognitive biases used that could be good examples for people that they might want to change some copy on their site right well i think uh, probably uh, i would focus for somebody who's just getting started uh, in this rather than focusing a lot on cognitive biases what i would do is uh, focus on say cialdini's principles originally six and now seven uh, and some of these relate to cognitive biases. Uh, uh, social proof, for example, is a mm. cognitive bias. Some people call it a bandwagon effect. Uh, you see other people doing something, you're more likely to do that thing yourself. So they aren't unrelated. But I think he provides a better framework for understanding these. And I think since I mentioned uh, social proof, uh, that's a great one. We see a lot of it already in digital marketing. You'll mm. see sign up for our newsletter, join 47,000 other subscribers like you to our newsletter. Uh, and that's, that's a smart way to market uh, yourself, whether it's listing your number of customers, users of your software, uh, whatever, because you are showing that other people are doing what you want this new person to do. And the more persuasive that argument is, the more comfortable they are doing it. Uh, you know, if you're looking for a restaurant and you come to, uh, two side by side, one is very busy, full of customers. Another one is completely empty. Even though you would get served faster in the empty one, you will probably choose the one with all the customers because you figure they know what they're doing. The other one might be questionable. Uh, but there are some things that you can do in social proof that exploit some additional biases. Uh, one is uh, there is a precision bias for numbers. Generally precise numbers are seen as more reliable, more truthful. You could Instead of saying we have 20,000 subscribers, you could use your actual number, which you probably have someplace in your software that's uh, 20,125. Uh, that's going to be accurate, it's going to be truthful, and it's going to be just a little bit more persuasive. Uh, you can use, instead of simple numbers, uh, you can use testimonials, uh, and testimonials are they're a form of social proof, uh, mm -hmm. but uh, they are most convincing if they include a photo or better even a video uh, showing that it's a real person. You know, when you see these testimonials of, 
wow, great product. And it's like two initials after that. You have no idea whether they just made that up for the website or whether it's actually a real person who needed to remain anonymous. But when you see uh, a real person whose photo is there, maybe their company affiliation is there, then that makes it more powerful. And in fact, one example that I've seen that's kind of interesting is it uh, blends social proof into authority. Authority is another Cialdini principle uh, that instead of being sort of regular people are doing this, it is uh, an endorsement or somehow somebody who is an expert in the field saying something good about your product or being a user of your product. Mm. And uh, that uh, that's very powerful. If you look at any business book, what do you see on the front or back cover? You see endorsements from best-selling authors, from subject matter experts. Uh, these are exploiting authority. You know, you may not have heard of Roger Dooley, but if you see endorsement from Bob Cialdini on the cover, you say, well, okay, maybe this Dooley guy knows something. Or maybe Bob was just doing him a favor. Who knows? Uh, that authority is very powerful. And uh, often it is, you know, if you're buying basketball shoes, uh, it's great to have social proof. Hey, we've sold uh, a million of uh, this particular style or some endorsements from uh, people who just randomly wear the shoe. But you would do much better with an endorsement from LeBron James or some other famous basketball player. Uh, and this applies in any field where there are people who are known authorities. You can get authority in different ways. Uh, you can have uh, people who merely have titles. Uh, if you're selling something even remotely related to health, having somebody uh, in a white lab coat, uh, somebody who is a doctor, whether they're a PhD or an MD, uh, all of these things lend authority. Using imagery, the person in a white lab coat who is actually in a lab with maybe a microscope and maybe some lab equ equipment around, uh, that's going to add a veneer of authority to your marketing. So all these things can do it. And, and to circle back to the point I was going to make, Jared, that uh, one company I saw used social proof in an interesting way, uh, in a very smart way, I think, as long as you don't uh, overdo it. Uh, they had some testimonials from three customers who used their software. It was pretty normal. Three sort of random people who use their software. They had what the nice thing the person said about it under it. They had a little icon-sized picture of the, of the individual, a photo of the individual, their name, uh, and their uh, company in tiny print underneath it. Above the text, though, they had a rather large logo from the company, and these were prominent companies. So mm -hmm. what they were doing was leveraging the fact that they had a happy user at this company into a little bit of authority that, hey, this person isn't just anybody. He works at Google or wherever, uh, and it almost turns it into an authority endorsement from Google. Not quite. If anybody really looks at it, they'll realize, okay, uh, this guy is not, you know, a Google uh, uh, senior fellow or something. It's probably some random person. But nevertheless, uh, it does have that uh, veneer of authority. So there, there are subtle cues you can use uh, to create authority. And when you combine authority and social proof that way, I think it makes a lot of sense.